This episode is brought to you by Trello, which is trusted by millions of brave souls around the world to help them keep track of all their projects and to-dos. Trello is the easy, free, flexible, and visual way to manage your projects and organize anything. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. This is the place where we expose the threads of heroism that stitch together the stories we admire most. As a musician, singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and business owner, I encounter some really fascinating stories. Every episode you'll hear features a revealing conversation with someone who courageously pours themselves out into the world. We'll talk about fears befriended, the terrors battled, and the courage created along our stories of bravery, quiet heroism, and all-out gutsiness. We open the Pandora's box of the dream-crushing constraints we all face during significant moments of bravery. These moments of bare-naked bravery are rarely censored in real life, so if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. The questions I ask today aren't scripted because I'm just curious. What is bravery? My hope for us all is that by listening to others search for and find their bravery, we will find our own. For that is what we need most, to know that we are not alone. The best way you can support the show is to share it with a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle's Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Bottom line, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. I'm so excited that we get to feature Giovanna Lever in today's episode. Giovanna is another Australian business gal pal of mine, and she really knows how to connect people. She also believes in the power of realness. She has an extensive experience in integrated business space, and she's performed and transformed and launched a number of brands and programs into the Australian market. I know how passionate she is to help people connect with purpose. So I knew she would be perfect for the show. I just knew it. But today we start out our conversation talking about parenthood, especially being a parent of a child who's facing a new definition of normal. And even though we talk a bit about her parenting and her kids at the beginning, I was struck by how much of her motherhood story was supported by her business expertise and vice versa, how her parenting wisdom enforces her business acumen. She really knows how to create a new normal for herself, for her kids, and even for her clients and the community that surrounds her. And she brings that new attitude to the work and the success around it in all of her life as well. So I know you will really love Giovanna's conversation with us today. Oh, and don't turn off the episode early because I have a present for you at the very, very end of the show. Okay, let's get to the episode. Are you ready for some bare naked bravery? Sure. Let's do this. What a great way to spend a Wednesday morning. <laughs> I know, right? So, Giovanna, you are here with us all the way from Australia. Hi, Emily. Great what, to be here. What part are you from? I am from Sydney. Okay. Okay, great. We don't have a lot. I mean, to my knowledge, I don't know if I have a lot of. Australian listeners. So I'm well, excited. You're about to. It's time to. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited about it. I think that a lot of these concepts that we end up talking about apply to so many cultures. And I'm really excited to have that spread out across the, the seas and the oceans. So tell us a little bit about your story and you can start from wherever you would like to begin. 
Yeah, sure. I guess from my perspective, I have had a, you know, I feel like I've had a really great life and I've had plenty of adversity in my life, but it's got a lot to do with my attitude and I reflect a lot on it. In fact, I reflect several times a day just going, what did my parents do to help me be like this? Because sometimes I, you know, thought about my parents as being, you know, somewhat negative, but on reflection, I don't think that's the case at all because you are the result of your maker or monkey see, monkey do. And so I like to say, and I, when I think about all the great things that my parents did for us as kids and the sacrifices for their, as their children, particularly being immigrants from Italy to Australia, but also for people around them as well, and particularly people that they hardly even knew and just really good people. So I guess the negativity sometimes came from when they felt that that wasn't appreciated at times. But, you know, when they gave, they gave completely freely. And that's certainly the way I live my life and, and trying to advocate for my children and their peers. How many kiddos do you have? I have two children. I have a son. His name's Harry. He's nine years old. And Lucy, she is seven years old. Well, they're about to have birthday parties. So they're about to be nine and seven. But <laughs> Not a detail. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what it was like to become a mom. Uh, look, I, I was really scared, really scared. I'd never changed a nappy before. I thought I had this thing going on and everyone and around. For, for the American listeners, a nappy is a diaper. So. <laughs> oh, a diaper. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, US. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. I just have to do some minor translation. <laughs> you might need to. I'll try and put any slang in this conversation. Oh my gosh. Put it in. Put it in. That makes it so much better. I don't want to be too cliche. <laughs> so anyway, I'd never changed a diaper and hadn't, you know, was never like one to be babysitting other people's kids or, or whatnot. But I loved kids and I loved the idea of always wanted to be a mum. You know, I felt like that was know a really important part and in terms of what I could give back and I have had and still have a you know flourishing career and so I'm very focused on work as well but I'm all about the balance as well and uh, yeah so but I was you know excited but I remember when my son was born I was so scared I was petrified and I remember coming home from the hospital and he was the best sleeper like he would be in bed by 5 p.m for the rest of the night and my husband would get rushed home and be like oh yeah that's that was so an hour ago he was you know amazing and but yet I would look at him and just go what do I do with you you're so good but this is so freaky I am completely responsible for you and then when my daughter came along Oh God, I'm responsible for two of you now. Holy cow. I told you before we started recording that I just visited my kids and it was really evident to me that my sister is definitely one of my heroes because of how much, not necessarily work, I mean, because some of it's play and fun and everything, but how much of her being a mom takes up. Yes, and look, I feel, yeah, I feel absolutely honoured to have had the opportunity to have had my children and I've had one miscarriage in between Harry and Lucy and some days I feel like there's someone missing in our family and that there should have been three kids but for many different reasons we have decided to just stop at two and so we're a unit of four, very nuclear. We'll never need a seven-seater car. Um, <laughs> But I feel very lucky um, and blessed to have had the opportunity to to be a mum. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about your kids. Yeah. So both are great and they're great mates. They fight, you know, like brother and sister normally do. And I think I had to threaten to cancel their birthday parties this morning if they didn't get dressed for school and <laughs> make, make their bed. And then all of a sudden they were as sweet as pie to each other. So that was pretty hilarious. So I walked away trying not to laugh in front of them. So my husband and I were you know, having a little giggle to each other. Such, you know, the threat of parenting, which everyone says, don't do. I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, it happens. But they're, they're both really great kids and each actually have their own health concerns. My daughter's requires more attention 
And at the end of the day, whilst there's stuff going on in my family, I, and as we would say, you know, everyone's got their shit, right? You know, nobody's shit is bigger than the other. So it's how you deal with it as a family. So my daughter, when she was born, all was, you know, swimmingly, no problems. When she was six months old and moved to solids, we noticed some strange behaviours in terms of her pooing. And I took her to a number of doctors, paediatricians, and was disregarded. And I guess what I really want to start off by saying is you got to, and I have this mantra at work as well, you got to listen to your gut because if your gut is telling you something, then 99.9% of the time it's 100% right. So my gut was saying there's something not right. And I ended up taking her to, for her six-month immunisation, or do you call them immunisations in the States? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So her jabs. And at the time, it was a health nurse who, who was doing them. And she said, well, gee, you don't look like your bubbly self. And I said, oh, I'm just a bit tired and a few concerns around Lucy. And I described those concerns. And just for her, um, just to protect her, her, I'm not going to go into the detail. Sure. And she picked it straight away and called me in the GP. And anyway, long story short, we got in to see a paediatric surgeon and on some further investigation, we discovered that she has a condition called Curarino's Triad Syndrome. Don't Google it. You won't find much. But actually, in saying that, there's increasingly more information about the Curarino's Triad Syndrome, and it's basically a gene mutation, HX something, something, something. And it causes a number of issues around the spine, the bottom, the bowel, etc. So for the best part of, so that was six months, she's now almost seven. So the best part of six and a half years, we've been on a journey to rectify a number of the issues around the Curinos. And we're up to, I think, our 20th operation. Wow. And there's daily care that needs to be done around that to help manage the, the bladder, the bowel, the bottom, the whole bits and bobs. But if you were to, walk, if you were to see her in, down the street, you wouldn't even know. You right. know? was anything going on she's a happy kid and and very balanced so I guess the so this will happen and my son was two years old and so he's always I guess everyone wants to talk about my daughter but I really want to take a point to talk about siblings and how important it is also to to create a great sense of normal and strength and gratitude for the carers in many cases it's, it's the siblings yeah a little bit about who we are and what we what we're what's going on in our life. Yeah. And so how did this diagnosis affect your son? Well, he was two, so he didn't really understand. So for him it's just normal, right? It's just part and parcel. We had him tested too, because of course with this it's a genetic related condition. So since found out that I have Curino's triad syndrome, which explains my years of bowel related issues. And so now I've got some answers. So I'm, you know, very much very conscious about rectifying mine. Mine are as mine are very mild, so I can manage them without surgery. Yeah. And so now that your son is older and and daughter older how do you see that they are brave well i just think they have a really good attitude to life they just do and i remember we were having a conversation in the car on the way to school recently and we were talking about difference and harry my son said well oh i know what my difference is and i said what's that and he said well i'm pretty short i'm like yep you are pretty short he is you know he is short, isn't he? You know, it's something that we are getting looked at at the moment, but nothing in terms of we've, we've had all the big things checked out when he was a baby. So we've already, we'd already sort of dealt with that, you know, worry with him. And I said, yeah, yeah, mate, you, you're pretty short, but gee, nothing's stopping you. You're probably one of the fastest runners and you've just got a really good attitude to life and you could kick some ass, not that I said that to him, yeah. because he's, like, he's almost a black belt in martial arts. So he's friends come over who are, you know, quite a bit taller, thinking that they're just going to really take him on. And they end up crying. I said, guys, you've really got to understand. He's almost a black belt, like, you know. But anyment anyway, he's talking about his difference. And he says, oh, you know, I feel sorry for my friend. 
blah. And I said, oh, what's going on with him? He said, oh, well, he was born with no knuckles. And, of course, I'm driving going, oh, oh, oh okay. But don't worry, Mum, he can still do the bridge. I'm like, the bridge? So, you know, when you're doing a race, a running race, and you have to get down on your knees and you put your hands, like your fingers, yeah, and ready, steady, go. That's the bridge that you do with your, feet, your hands. Like, all oh, right, you know, it's called the bridge. He goes, oh, no, it's cool. He can still do the bridge. I'm like, how? Oh, wow, how does he do the bridge? Anyway, so we're just chatting about, you know, different um, kids and, you know, one of my best friends, her daughter um, has vision impairment and um, another, my best friend in um, Ireland, her daughter has some medical needs as well. Anyway, so we're just chatting about people in our life and how it just isn't a thing. And my daughter says, oh, I wonder what my difference is. And I'm driving and I'm like, oh, okay, well, we'll just see how this one washes. I said, what do you think your difference is, sweetie? And she goes, huh. I know, it's my eczema. And I said, absolutely, it's your eczema. So, and I tell that story, I tell that story to anyone who wants to listen because we have really worked hard to not make this a thing. She goes in a hospital, there's no gifts. It's just part of of life. You know, there's the kids really understand what's going on inside their bodies. The penis is the penis. The vulva is the vulva. The vagina is the vagina. Like nothing's got those silly names. We talk about respecting your body and, and all of that. So when the kids are talking about their difference and I'm like, that's right. That is your difference. You've got eczema because we're just normal because this is our normal. How did you as a mom learn to have this new normal well i guess well you know i do get the shits you know sometimes and my husband and i are like oh god like you know it just doesn't stop and you know, and i you know i've got the gene so i'm the one who passed it on to her so it is natural for me to feel guilty i would it would be remiss of me and i would be lying if i said days i don't like i'm not riddled with guilt but i do know also in my head that well, that's done now, so we need to just move on. So I guess this is also my mantra at work as well, but I just get on because I think I can do one or two things. I can crawl up in a ball in the corner of the room, and there's been times where I've had done that, or I could just get on because at the end of the day, every, like I said at the beginning, everyone's got shit, and to them their shit's big. And the person next door's got, you know, the kid's got no knuckles, for goodness sakes. You know, it's, it's lots of different things always happening. And, and I think we need to lead by example. So that doesn't mean that I'm pretending. If I've needed to seek help, I do seek help. And I do talk about it because I think it's important. And, yeah, I just think, you know, if monkey see, monkey do. So if, if my kids can see that... I advocate for other people and I support other people and I believe in developing people, which is a lot of what I do in my workspace and, and with my Facebook group, which you're all part of, Emily. But if they can see that, I hope that helps them grow up to be great individuals and to continue to be brave because bravery, like that's an extreme example what I've explained with the kids, but bravery also includes getting up in front of people and presenting. Bravery to me, and I'm actually doing a strengths challenge at the moment. One of the girls in the Smart Sparrow group is running the strengths challenge. And my strength I'm working on this week is bravery. And one would say, oh, well, you're pretty brave, Javon. I'm like, well, I need to start saying no because I do so much that I'm kind of starting to stretch myself a little bit thin. So I need to be brave to say no and to put the worth, the value of my work, you know, in place. How does saying no look like in your life right now how does it look yeah or what, well, what was the last thing you said no to that you can tell us about yeah sure so I'm working on this project which is a co-op brewery in Sydney and I'm leading the marketing committee but it is there's a mark there's a marketing committee a, a beer committee a finance committee uh, blah, blah 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 right so I'm leading a positioning workshop on Saturday and we need to find $1.2 million of funding to open this co-op brewery. So I'm doing the strategic work up front, but I was starting to feel like I was being treated like the office bitch. 
Yeah. And I run a consultancy, so I bill by the hour. So I also have to be careful that the clients that are paying me, that I'm looking after them, you know, as well. And when my time is limited because of the flexibility I need with work. So I was feeling a little bit like I was treated like the office bitch. And so I just had to say no. I said, look, no, you know, we are a committee. So I, I am taking the time out to prepare for the strategic piece. So can you do this, please? And I felt pretty good. I must tell Michelle, who's doing the Strengths Challenge, that I've done that. So, yeah, I, I can be a bit of a pleaser, I guess, Emily. So saying no is really hard because I just so want to help people. And, yeah, so that's what that looks like. Oh, I me. hear you. Saying no is, is really oh. hard. Mm. Absolutely. Especially because, when you, when you want to do it. Mm, 100%. And I'm just on time limitations, which is why I work for myself because it allows me to work on projects that A, I believe in and B, can fit in with my lifestyle. You know, I've done working for the man and I am terrible at saying no. What happens is my family then a compromise fight because I put everything in because I don't want to let anybody down and end up letting myself down and my family down. Now this is getting better. Putting together a podcast was a crazy idea I've had for a long while. One of the reasons I put it off so long was all the details, scheduling, to-dos, emailing, and editing processes required to publish a single podcast episode. It's a lot of work but it's worth it. And Trello might be the single reason why you're listening to this podcast right now. It helped me set up a simple way to visualize the production process of every episode. And I'm a visual learner, so spreadsheets don't always do the trick with me. Trello will help you manage any project you've got going on, family grocery lists, working with your assistant, brainstorming ideas, collaborating on that film project, or researching that ant farm hobby. Trello is simple on the surface, but has everything you need to get stuff done. Post comments for instant feedback, upload files from your computer, Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, add checklists, labels, due dates, and so much more. And the notifications make sure you always know when important stuff happens. It's free and you can sign up by going to barenakedbravery.com forward slash Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. Now, when did you start doing the, the working for yourself and not working for the man? Yeah, so I started not working for the man. Um, so I started in August last year, but I took, and I took a general management role to transform a a startup here in Sydney. But I made the grave mistake that it was a full-time one client contract. It was an amazing project. Don't get me wrong. And I loved loved every bit of it. I loved the people and the people who were running it and all of that. But I was just, it was no different to working for the man, but less money because I didn't negotiate very well because I I, um, thought I was going to be working on other projects, right? So I would find myself, you know, compromised. So it was really April this year where I had to say no. It was so hard and I'm not so sure if they really do understand the whys, but, I, you know, I had, to try, I had to for once put myself and my family. So, you know, I'm kind of like, well, you know, if you don't get it, there's not much more I can really do. So I went out on my own officially as Smart Sparrow um, integrated business solutions in April and it's been great. It's been great. So I would say officially April, but unofficially I have been out on my own since August last year. Yeah. It's been like smooth sailing and everything. There's been no hiccups. Oh, my biggest worry is I hope people pay me. Oh, so <laughs> far, so good. <laughs> because that's the biggest issue with consultancies or agencies. and whatnot. I know. I'm really, really careful, though, about what work I pick up. And so when I meet with a potential client, I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me because, and I'll go back to this gut thing, Emily, because if my gut says, I smell a rat, I will walk away. And if it just doesn't feel right, because most of the time if I smell a rat, those people, they're not going to pay you. And they're not going to respect the work that you do. Oh, I mean, I I fully back that too. Yeah, the the marketing consult, the marketing clients that I have had and 
and have, I stand by that gut feeling all the time. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, sometimes I'll work with somebody anyways, because I know that I can actually still help them, Mm -hmm. but I just have that like red flag always Mm -hmm. like, this is a red flag client. (laughs) Um, Because I guess, um, you know, I've only got so many hours in the day. I want to make sure the work that I'm doing is fulfilling and, you know, I'm, I'm working on a startup idea as well when that happens around, you know, in the early mornings, in the wee hours of the morning with my business partner. She's in Canberra, which is the nation's capital for those who don't know. And um, so, you know, we're having these calls in the wee hours of the morning, but, you know, this is a, a passion project for, for me that, you know, and it's, it, it is around helping people in the mentoring space, mentoring something that I do professionally, but really taking it to a scalable model. But, you know, time is precious. So I want to make sure the work that I'm doing is A, I'm going to pay me, so value value my experience, and B, be projects that I believe in. So, you know, working for, I don't know, if there's something that doesn't fit in with my value system, and I have, you know, those values that I hold for my business are the same values that I have personally, then I... I walk away. I'll always try to find them a solution though. I never like to leave people in the lurch. Mm-hmm. So I, I won't just say no. I'll say, look, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not right for me or I can't help you or it's a bit too low level or what have you, but I'll always find them a solution. So that's how I get around saying no. I never leave people in the lurch. Mm. That's a really good tip. Mm. No, but you can do this, giving them another option. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then that just sort of, what happens then is I normally pass that work onto someone in my network. It doesn't mean that it's bad for them. It just wasn't right for me. And then they can make their own choice whether they, you know, are interested in the work or not. So, and I do, I do believe in supporting. I nurture my network very well and I really, you know, respect yeah. my network. So I believe in if I'm going to pass on work, then I'm going to look to my network first. So how did you learn or what, are, what lessons are you learning about valuing yourself? I'm pretty good at what I do, but I, I, I really questioned myself for a long time. And my husband's pretty pragmatic. He always says, you know, keep your expectations low and then you get surprised and delighted. But he's got a really pragmatic approach and he's a very, very clever, clever man. And he just looked at me perplexed and goes, you're so good at what you do. I'm not sure why you're even questioning. He says, it just kind of happens. And I went, oh, because you need to believe in yourself, man. I went, oh, okay. Well, and I think um, I was actually, we were talking about in the Smart Story group last week with Tao, a psychologist in the group, about hyper-striving. I think it's because for many years I was hyper-striving. So hyper-striving, Emily, means you say you've got these goals, okay, I'm going to get to the end of this project or I'm going to get to a general manager position or, I don't know, something. You know, everyone's got their, and you get to, you go, huh, well, that was a bit of an anticlimax. Okay, we'll keep going again. And you don't take the time to stop, reflect, celebrate the win and all of that. So I'm doing that more. And as I do that more, it's helping me value the work that I do. Even last night I was writing some notes for, I've got an event on Thursday night for Smart Sparrow and I'm just like, you know, writing a few notes on who to thank and, and I'm like, whoa, look at all these people who have come pulled together for this event. This is bloody amazing. But before I wrote those notes, I was questioning, I was just questioning that. And was that as successful as I was hoping it to be? And I was like, oh, wow. So it took the moment to do a happy dance. And I'm not kidding. I literally do do a happy dance. My happy dance is the same as my fun dance as my every other dance, kind of like this strange sort of like robot thing going on. But yeah, just took a moment. And I think that's what, to value yourself, you need to be able to stop and reflect on the good, bad and the ugly. Because I think we are all just running so quickly in life. It's almost becoming this competition of who's busy, who's the busiest, who's the sickest, who's the super woman, you know, working while they're sick because I see that on Facebook and I'm just writing to my friends, just go home and be sick because the world is not going to collapse around you because I used to be like that. You know, just be sick because when you are sick, you have clouded judgment. And so I've made those mistakes, you know, where I just felt like I had to just keep going 
And so I think when you're doing it, when you, when you start to have a bit of self-care and reflect on your achievements and your challenges, that helps in terms of being able to value yourself and, and helps you also then deal when you're going through moments of adversity, I guess, and, and needing to put your big brave girl pants on. Yeah. When I teach cello lessons, my cello students often will, you know, they'll rush through. The tendency is to practice, 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 or repeat the part Mm -hmm. of the piece of music until you get it correctly and not take the time to acknowledge what you did well, even though it wasn't perfect. And you actually do yourself a disservice if you make an attempt that wasn't totally successful and you don't take the time to say what went well, what didn't. Well, it's because we're all, you know, I worry about our generation for the future, Emily, because they are, you know, we've got higher level of levels of anxiety and it's the need to be perfect. And, you know, I've said to a, say to a lot of my mentees as well, those I mentor about, you don't need to be perfect, you know, and I, for a long time, perfectionist. And so I compete against one person. That's myself. I don't care about what anybody else is doing. I just don't. I never have. Yeah. Even competing against yourself has issues as well. But I think what I, what I worry about for the generation for the future is this need to be amazing, you know. And the kids always know what my, you know, I say, what does mum say? And they go, there's always a solution to everything. I said, there is always a solution to everything. I might go about it in a roundabout, crazy way and someone will come in and go, well, if you just did one, two, three, that could have solved it. But everything is solvable, even when you feel like you've really mucked up or stuffed up. Admitting fault takes the monkey off your back. And most of the time people are okay with it. As long as you're coming up with a way that you, an attempt to try to fix it, right? right. But there's been, but the, because people don't want to be wrong and don't want to ever admit to be wrong, they're all striving to be amazing. And I worry then that what's going to happen for the next generation. And I guess, you know, it's a big passion point of mine to create a better workforce for the future, which is, yeah, why I do what I do, because you can't just come in and do a job for a client. You've got to leave them in a better place. And you've got to, if you need to skill the team, you skill the team so you can leave a legacy so they can learn and feel like they, they can do better. But be okay with saying, hey, I actually don't know how to do it. Like I, I don't, now, you know, I'm out on my own. For years I had a team of graphic designers and web designers and, and the more senior I got, the less hands-on I was. So now I'm out on my own. Geez, just before I had the podcast with you, I'm in Survey Monkey for a client of mine, working on a, on a survey, which is part of a larger communication and advocacy strategy. But I'm like, geez, how do I do this particular question that needs multiple this and da da da? I'm like, oh, okay, we'll just do this. Oh, geez, it worked great. So, great. You know, there's a way, there's a solution to everything. You, we just have to be better at just saying, hey, I don't know. Or, I'm, I'm actually a little bit scared. People are good people. I know there's a lot of terrible stuff that goes on in this world, but I am a big believer that humanity will always prevail. I mean, my in-laws, just as a side, Emily, my in-laws are currently riding their motorbike from Australia to Italy. They are in Turkey now. So they've been through Southeast oh. Asia, Korea, Russia, all the stands, so Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc. Iran, Georgia, they're now in Turkey, oh, Mongolia, and their blog is amazing, but because what it shows is the amazing culture, but also humanity and how embracing these cultures have been of Bev and David and their trip. And even in Mongolia, they got to a big mass of water and like, oh, are we going to can't go around it, can't go over it, we're going to have to go through it. And I'm like, oh, and Mongolia is full of nomads, right? So you don't see anybody for days. And then it was like a calling from somewhere. These nomads rock up, don't speak a word of English, but somehow managed to help Beverly and David get through the water six hours later 
and off Bev and David went. Now, those nomads had to get back over. So that's 12 hours of their day. So people are good and people do want to help you, you know, and I think we need to start going, you know what, let's just be okay with just being ourselves and saying if we're not doing okay and we need a bit of help. And I think that's the epitome of bravery. Oh, of course. Well, first of all, asking for help is really great. And just in general, it's really great. It's also really great. To, yeah. Yeah. It's also really equally brave to help someone else. 100%. Yeah. And I think bravery can be normalized just like, just like any other difference can be normalized in your life. And I think for the bravest of us, you and me and listeners, when we normalize our own bravery, then there is more of it. I think so. And I'm starting to see that with the Smart Sparrow group. I have this mantra is that if you give yourself freely without immediate return in your work life and in your personal life, there will be a bigger door that will fling open for you. It may not be for that direct person, but the goodness that you have given there without a what's in it for me will lead. It's a whole, you know, what comes around goes around saying, because I tell you, great stuff happens to me every day, but it's how you look at it. Some people, if someone else was in my body, they'd be like, I've got so much shit going on right now. But I just, every day I marvel, like I am marveling right now. I almost want to just grab you through the, through the Skype and give you a big hug that we're even having this conversation that I've met you and that, I can hopefully get my message out there and inspire others, um, get more awareness about Curino syndrome, hopefully advocate for my wider network to be brave and help others. So I'm like marveling right now. Like I almost want to do like my happy dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy dance. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, so Chivana, I am going to put the link to your Smart Sparrow group in the show notes. And so our listeners can take a peek at what that looks like. It's basically just a wonderful little community of business owners. Yeah, so it's, it's, well, it's not, it's about diversity because I am a big believer for society to be successful professionally and personally, we need diversity. Now I'm not talking about diversity equals women. I'm talking about diversity in all gender. Male, because you know what, men's, men have got feelings too. I know that we've had, I know we've had a bit of a shitty ride with them in decades before, but I mean, come on, let's, let's you know, all work together. So men, women, transgender, transsexual, there's no age barrier, there's no experience barrier. It's about diversity. Like we've got CEOs and people sitting on multiple boards in that group. Through to, I've got a 14-year-old who's here in Sydney in the group who's trying to get into the Australian Ballet. So it is so diverse, but I believe that if you open yourself to learning from other people and cross industries, not just your own, your ability to grow personally and professionally just goes in leaps and bounds. Because if I just dealt with marketers or when I was working in just tourism, just dealt with tourism people, that's pretty boring. You know, there's only so much air kissing one can do when you work and travel, right? So I just, I guess for years, you know, it's about people saying, oh, gee, do you know, do you know someone who, know, you know, know, I've got this problem. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know someone who knows someone who knows somebody. So it's about the six degrees of connection. Right. And through that, learning from each other and growing and nurturing yourself professionally and personally. So it's, it is business owners, but it's also, you don't have to be an entrepreneur because every man and his dog wants to be an entrepreneur. Apparently I'm a solopreneur, but I'm just Giovanna Lieber. I'm not anything fancy. I'm just doing what I do. It's about diversity of society needs entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and pe- doctors, nurses, teachers, and people working for the man. And I think what's happening is that Everyone's trying to be an entrepreneur and innovate, which is amazing. But what we're forgetting is that these fundamental careers, nursing, teaching, doctors, dentists, trades, plumbers, electricians, etc. It's like if you're not an entrepreneur, you're not doing well. Like that's bullshit. Oh my gosh. So much so. So much so. We need everyone to be their own version 
of Brave. 100%, 100%. And, and that's why, you know, I started Smart Sparrow because I think together with this movement, we're going to create a better society. We're going to create a better workforce for the future. And I really want to, you know, show people how to network properly with heart, not to business card shove, no egg kissing, get to know the person first and the rest just comes. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks, Emily. It's the best way to spend my Wednesday morning. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Okay, so beyond the Bare Naked Bravery coloring book, which you can get at barenakedbravery.com forward slash color, your brave takeaway from today's show is to spend some time asking yourself what your version of brave looks like. I think we do a lot of energy hustling just to become someone else's version of normal or someone else's version of brave. But what I think we really need is to be our own version of normal and our own version of brave. So spend some time journaling about that this week, or when you go on your run tomorrow, chew on those questions with a kick-ass playlist. Speaking of playlists, the gift that I mentioned at the beginning of the show is my Spotify playlist of songs that I have collected that you need. It is about 270 plus songs deep and I'm always adding to the list. So, and I've used all kinds of genres, so there'll definitely be something in there for you to enjoy. That playlist and all the links to keep up with Giovanna Lever are in the show notes for today's episode. And you can find all of that by going to Bare nakedbravery.com and just searching for Giovanna Lever. We would love to hear all about your favorite parts of today's Bare Naked Bravery. And you can find myself and Giovanna on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. And if you share us on social media, all I ask is that you tag us so that we can cheer you on and see what everything you're up to spy on you in a very supportive kind of way, you know. (laughs) So that's our show this week. And I just want to thank you again for listening. I know that you have a lot of things you can listen to throughout the week, but I do not take it lightly that you have chosen this little hour to spend with Giovanna and myself. If you are digging the music in today's episode, that's because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique sound tracks. To find out more about all of the artists and musicians and other sponsors of the show, please visit barenakedbravery.com forward slash sponsors. I'm really looking forward to being with you next week. We have some super cool things in store for you as always. And until then, I have one message for you. It's this, be yourself, be vulnerable, be brave because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. 